constrained to what I'm going to be talking about specific, specific study here. My interests are both in silicic plastics and carbonates. This is going to be an example of focus on uh, silicic plastics. Um, and I would say that most of my work and research that I've done in the past is, is focused on subsurface reservoirs. And in, for the most part, those have been filled with oil, and natural gas, and water. But a lot of what I'm talking about today is applicable if we just remove the oil and gas, it would still be applicable to failing contained water. And so it is, in this particular case, it involves a, a study where we've done a lot of detailed outcrop-related work to try to improve our understanding of subsurface reservoirs in this portion of the PM space. And so as far as an outline, talk about the research objectives for this study. Uh, this, this is work that's gone on for about the last 12 years, and we're still working on it to some degree. Uh, talk about the study area, the geologic setting, and the stratigraphy. Uh, discuss how we've tried to describe and quantify these different alluvial sandstone body types, the different types of deposits that are present within these meandering and graded river deposits. Uh, using the outcrop to quantify and make observations regarding the dimensions and the geometries of these deposits. And then, not stopping there, then taking that information, because that type of information is very valuable and essential information as input to 3D reservoir models, and there's different types of modeling methods you could use. So we're using this outcrop information to augment our understanding of the subsurface reservoirs, build 3D reservoir models of these reservoirs, and then use them to evaluate static connectivity and even dynamic connectivity, so doing fluid flow simulations. I won't talk so much about that today, but in terms of uh, geothermal reservoirs, again, same type of thing. We're just talking mainly geothermal about water. In this case, they're also interested in, in this particular area in terms of the natural gas. They're looking at these flow pathways. And then in the some observations, and we have to have that issue slide. So the research objective, so here was uh, really just to get some basic information regarding these fluvial deposits that are being drilled within the subsurface of uh, the Piance Basin by these oil companies. And they're trying to understand, you know, how many, for example, just basic things, like how many wells should they place within a given reservoir and what spacing should they be. And so part of this is to evaluate the stratigraphic variability and the reservoir. And most of what I'm going to be talking about is more reservoir scale. But the reservoir scale architecture for the, the geometry of these different deposits and how they're spatially distributed. Establish a database of fluvial sandstone body dimensions for reservoir modeling. And that, when we use the word modeling, it's kind of that fancy word, but just think of it as mapping. We can do that in either 3D or 2D. And then establish relationships among sandstone body types, uh, sandstone body parameters, and reservoir connectivity. For example, one of the things that might be, may or may not be obvious, but for example, as these different fluvial deposits that are preserved within the subsurface, as their dimensions, as they become wider and more wide, that enhances connectivity within the subsurface reservoirs, for example. So that's what this is referring to. And then last, applying those outcrop by based concepts and our observations from outcrop uh, and the different dimensional statistics to improve how we do our integrated reservoir characterization. And this has been primarily sponsored by industry However, uh, it's also been sponsored by the American Chemical Society, and this is the research partnership for to secure energy for America, which is basically funded, provides our funding, their funding is provided by the DOE. And then before I move on, so that those were the kind of sponsoring companies, but this work also, it's been going on for like the last 12 years. There's been a lot of students that have worked on this, and a lot of what I'm showing you is based on their work. And I've also collaborated with a professor at Colorado Mesa University. His name is Dr. Rex Cole, and he's more of a sedimentologist and stratigrapher. And he does a lot of the earlier work out in this part of the Piance Basin. And I've kind of joined forces with him. And so this shows the study area. So we're talking in the Piance Basin in uh, northwestern Colorado. And so this shows the outline of the Piance Basin. Grand Junction is down here. Glenwood Springs is over here. And one of the nice things about this area that makes it great for studying these types of deposits is that, so within the center part of the basin, so here's I-70 and the Colorado River, within the center portion of the basin where you see all those red blobs, those are natural gas fields that produce from the upper portion of the Mesa Verde group, it's upper Cretaceous in age. And the exact same rock formations that they produce from within the subsurface 
makes this a nice area is shown by these green, this green shading. So the same rock formations outcrop along the margins of the basin. So it's a nice outdoor laboratory where we can go and study those same rock formations. In some cases, very close, say 10, 10 to 15 miles away from the outcrop belt, maybe up to about 50, 60 miles away from the outcrop belt, and get detailed information from the outcrop to improve how we're going to characterize and, and map those subsurface reservoirs in, within the middle portion of the Piamps Basin. And so we've done a lot of work through time in this part of the world, and there's been both subsurface studies here funded by different groups. We've done quite a bit of work that I'm going to be talking about today in this area, just, just east of Grand Junction in this, this area here uh, that's called Coal Canyon. Um, and then we've kind of expanded a lot of this outcrop work from down here up along the Douglas Creek Arch, and then most recently we've actually expanded over into Utah and looked at uh, some of the subsurface fields here just to the west of the Douglas Creek Arch. And if we zoom in on an area down here and just focus in on this Coal Canyon area, which I'll talk about most today, that's what's shown here. And so the, these rocks that are exposed here at Outcrop, again, dip gently into the Piamps Basin where they're producing natural gas. Um, we have, these are all upper Cretaceous in age. We have the, the Rollin sandstone, which is part of the Isles Formation. These are primarily shallow marine deposits. Someone asked earlier, I think over here, about differences in the different types of sedimentary deposits and how some might be more homogeneous or maybe less heterogeneous than others. The Rollin sandstone, for example, and some of the formations below it are these shallow marine deposits. That would be one example of a type of reservoir assuming it has, hasn't been significantly altered by diagenesis, where you're going to expect more laterally continuous types of deposits within that environment deposition. Whereas as you move stratigraphically up here, upward, we're going from more of a shallow marine setting into more of a continental setting. And so in this cameo zone, we start to get more of our coastal types of deposits, swampy types of deposits, coals that are preserved, and these kind of marginal marine deposits that transition from more meandering river types of deposits and get up and work into these braided river types of deposits. So all those little bumps that you see sticking out of the outcrop there, those are these different fluvial deposits that have been preserved in the rock record that form the subsurface reservoirs in the Piamps Basin. And so part of this work has been looking and making, make, making measurements on these different sandstone bodies by sandstone body type, you know, what type of deposit is it, and then just basic statistics, like what are the dimensions and characteristics of these deposits, at least as, in terms of how we can measure them from outcrop. And so one of the first things geologists do, of course, is try to get a, what's the story like back at the time these were deposited. So back in the late Cretaceous, about 75 million years ago, you know, we had this Cretaceous interior seaway where the, the sea existed all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up through the central part of the United States into the Arctic. And so this shows where the Piatts Basin is located here in Colorado, in, uh, northwest of Colorado at this particular time. But it also shows the, the major mountain belt that existed along the western part of the United States over in the western part of Utah, the severe orogenic belt, basically the severe mountains. And most of the sediment that was being deposited in this part of the world and then also in the Piance Basin, was originated from the severe orogenic belt and transported to the east and filling in this portion of, of the United States. So if we kind of zoom in on that Piance Basin area, a little bit larger, we can see so this would be north on this schematic where we see the severe orc mountains over here. And so they're providing sediment that's being transported to the east and we have a transition from these different types of environments of deposition from more of these alluvial plain types of deposits, more, for example, braided river types of deposits, higher gradients, more bed load. And then as the gradient drops and we have more suspended load, we transition from more of a braided type setting into these more meandering river deposits. Then as we get to the coast, we get shallow marine deposits that form our beaches. And then the black areas would be areas that are more swampy that when preserved, that would be the coals. In part, it's believed that the coals in the lower part, if I go back one, a couple, it's 
means that, that the coals in the lower part of that strat of that stratigraphic interval may be the source of the natural gas that eventually worked its way up and is stored down within these different fluvial deposits in the upper part of the Cretaceous. There's also coals within below this. Below what you see here is the Manka Shale. There's also coals and, and organic rich mudstones that are associated with that that are also believed to be the, the source of the natural gas in this interval. So through time, so this is like one snapshot in time. It's a static image. But through time, all these different depositional systems moved or prograded from west to east, eventually filling in this Cretaceous interior seaway. And so what we end up with is a stratigraphic succession. So you saw the outcrop. So we have this stratigraphic succession. We have the, the Isles Formation, the Rollins Sandstone would be that shell and ring type of deposit. And then we transition it into this cameo coal zone, this cameo zone, and then move upward into these fluvial deposits of the Williams Fork. And then we have the Cretaceous tertiary boundary here, the Cretaceous age, or tertiary age strata above it. What this doesn't necessarily show on this diagram, but what, what we also have as we move stratigraphically upward is a corresponding increase in the sandstone percent. And so we're going from relatively uh, lower net to gross ratio or sandstone percent, deeper in the interval, and get, as we gradually move upward, we get a higher percentage of sandstone. And it's, it's believed in part to coincide with a, the change in the fluvial system where we're going from potentially more, uh, primarily more meandering, but you might have some anastomosed uh, streams where that's just where you have a single channel with branches and then joins back together again. But primarily more meandering river types of deposits, then those transition upward into the more of these uh, braided, dominated river deposits. And so, what we're trying to do is look at the outcrop information, make some measurements from outcrop, but then we like to tie that then to the subsurface because that's ultimately what we're wanting to use the data for to improve the characterization. So we'd like to try to tie that to some well data. And one of the nearest wells to the outcrop, so the outcrop is here in Coal Canyon, one of the nearest wells to that that actually penetrates the entire stratigraphic interval is shown by this red dot. That's the summer middle number one well that was drilled up on. Grand, for those of you who know this area, Grand Mesa is right here, and that was drilled all the way through the Mesa, down all the way through the Williams Fork Formation. So again, on the, our well log, we have this gamma ray log here, and we have the Rollins sandstone, those shallow marine deposits, and then we have this lower sandstone percent, the sandstone core interval of the Williams Fork, and then that trans transitions <laughs> upward into the sandstone rich interval of the Williams Fork, and then we have the tertiary deposits on top of that the Wasatch Formation. So, okay, enough. so I already pointed out, so this is where the location of this summer well number one well is. So then we can look and compare that to the outcrop. So for example, this lower sandstone core interval, we compare it to that picture I already showed you where here's the Rollins sandstone, here's the cameo interval, and then here are this relatively lower, lower net to gross, these different fluvial deposits peeking out of the outcrop from which we can make these measurements. And so these are just some simple images that kind of convey the different types of fluvial deposits within the stratigraphic interval of interest. So primarily a man meandering river system, we have crevasse flay type deposits. So during flood stage, we have a breach in, in the channel. That sediment pours out onto the floodplain to form some more lobate deposits there, somewhat more silty than say, for example, uh, these point bar deposits associated with the meandering river. And so some simple terms we might use to describe those would be simple sinuous types of sandstone bodies. So no genetic connotation, just a, just a, gen, uh, descriptive, uh, a descriptive uh, term to describe these. But this would be, for example, a point bar type of sandstone body. And then those, as the, mean, as the river channel meanders through time, the channel deposits can scour into each other and we can get multi-story types of deposits here or compound sinuous. So they have a lot of scour surfaces in there that might cause additional heterogeneity within the sandstone bodies. So that's the lower sandstone core interval. And then we, as we transition upward, we get much higher net to gross ratio, much higher sandstone percent. That's what you see here. This is one of the next canyons over. And these are really relatively thicker sandstone bodies in through here say 50 feet, and they can get even up to ones that, for example, this interval in through here, 
is almost 200 feet thick, and I don't have a, unfortunately don't have an image here to show, but it's a it's a sandstone interval that can be correlated all the way across most of the Piance Basin. So these types of amalgamated sandstone bodies can stack to become quite thick intervals that are laterally correlatable across great distances. So here it's believed that potentially the, these systems may change from more of this compound sinuous types of deposits to maybe more of low sinuosity to braided type fluvial deposits as we increase the net gross ratio. And so maybe for a map view example of what we're talking about, maybe something like this, the Anamas River in Colorado, kind of more of a braided character to the, the, to the deposits, relatively lower sinuosity than a than meandering river deposits. So how are we looking at these? How are we mapping these deposits and then using them? So the initial effort that was used to map these um, was basically field mapping. So doing detailed measured sections and then basically taking a handheld GPS unit and walking them out and also a Jacob staff or tape measure and actually walking them out and measuring the thickness of these different sandstone bodies by type. And you can measure with, the, for example, as a GPS unit, measure the, the end points or where the sandstone bodies terminate, at least in outcrop, to get an apparent width from the outcrop. Now we're, we're kind of at the mercy of how nature has eroded the canyons that we're making the measurements from. And even if we, tr even if we somewhat know the orientation of that deposit, we don't exactly know how much nature has scoured in and removed the deposit such that we don't know if we're in the middle of the deposit or they're in the edge, so there is some uncertainty there. But we make these measurements, we make a lot of them, and use, can use that information, those statistical data, to help in how, trying to understand how they might be dis, uh, distributed within the subsurface. And so the initial effort was this, what we refer to as ground pounding, actually in the field, using measure sections and GPS measurements. And then we transitioned, and I'll, I'll go through kind of a, an example why, to acquiring an aerial LIDAR survey, that's what this is, so 65 square miles that we acquired, we contracted the company from Denver to do this American company. That combined with, at the same time they were acquiring high resolution LIDAR, they were actually acquiring a, a aerial photography as well. And then you can also just take, especially with the cameras today, high megapixel, take really high resolution photographs of the outcrop and use that to start to map these deposits. So from that initial mapping, just with the handheld GPS and, and measured sections, this shows a map view. So this would be one section, so one square mile. And each one of these little traces here would be the trace of an individual sandstone body from outcrop. The blue are the location of the measured sections. And so from this initial mapping, 136 sandstone bodies were measured. And apparent width measurements were obtained, as well as the thickness of the sandstone bodies. You know, several measurements of the thickness of the sandstone bodies uh, in outcrop. And then what we were hoping to try to do, especially because the areas as you get higher up on the cliff become less accessible, we thought we might try to use some other type of, type of technology even before we went to the aerial LIDAR. And so we tried a ground-based or a terrestrial LIDAR, tripod-based LIDAR. It's kind of a pilot study. And so Dave Jeanette, who was at the time at the Bureau of Economic Geology, the Texas Bureau of Economic Geology. Prior to that, he was with ExxonMobil. Um, he was running a group there where they were doing quite a bit of this. And so he came out and shot just one particular point bar deposit and scanned it in detail. And this one point bar deposit became the focus, basically the thesis of one of my former students, Amanda Ellison. And she just focused primarily on that, trying to look at the internal heterogeneity of this one point bar deposit using the LIDAR and outcrop measurements as her data. So for scale here, here's some forces for scale. This is actually an area that's one of four wild horse and burrow preserves within Colorado. And so during different parts of the year, there's a lot of mustangs around that, you, that are your friends during your field work. So this was back in May of 2003 when we acquired the LIDAR data. And so this kind of shows a topo map showing the out, where the outcrop was uh, exposed, and this shows a couple different views of the outcrop. This one here is probably the better one, but this is shows the uh, the orientation of the point bar. And 
the way you're looking at it, flow would be out towards you. And it's really nice. So then these are measured sections that were acquired. And this one shows really nice lateral accretion units. In some cases in outcrop, there are mudstone layers, mudstone drapes that can be preserved on top of those lateral accretion area units. And this is something that John kind of mentioned earlier that provides this internal heterogeneity. And in some cases, those mudstone drapes, they go all the way across, and he alluded to that. And in other cases, they may just be laterally discontinuous and not extend all the way across. They may be partially removed because of the erosion in the channel. And then, so that, and you can really see those nicely here. If you look at the orientation of the same point bar, though, uh, par parallel to the paleo flow direction, that's this. And you can't really see those uh, lateral accretion units here just because of the orientation of that body relative to paleo flow. And again, these are measured sections here. And to give you kind of a, an idea of scale of the deposit, we look at that middle image. This shows Amanda here. She's actually ascending up to get her measured section and detailed grain size information. And so that kind of gives you an idea for the scale of one of these point bar deposits. So what can we do with this? So we can take that information from the LIDAR from outcrop and generate detailed 2D or 3D images or models of the outcrop. And in this particular case, because what we observe in outcrop, again, we can have some situations where we might have more of a, so this, this interval in here would be our point bar deposit. And then these would be primarily mudstones, flood plain uh, mudstones. In some cases, we might have more of a, you might have a situation where they're not, we don't have well-preserved uh, mudstone drapes on those accretionary units like this. In other cases, they may extend all the way across the point bar. And in this particular case, they're kind of laterally discontinuous. They've been removed. They're only preserved on the topographic highs of those lateral accretion units. And then over here, this just shows an example of variation in grain size going across that point bar. And so, as just an example of the type of things you can do with these data is explore different scenarios in terms of trying to understand the impact of that heterogeneity, that internal heterogeneity on say flip flow or storage. And so in this, in this case, you use this information to model those different scenarios. So this first one's lithology model number one where we have kind of a tank. Here we have these lateral accretion units going all the way across and they kind of serve as baffles. They're not permeability barriers are just baffles to flow. And down here we have these lateral accretion units that are or with the mudstone drapes, but they're just laterally discontinuous. And so in this particular case, we have an injection well here, injection well, and over here we have a product producing well. And what you're going to see here is the time it takes for, in this case, water, a molecule of water to move from this well over to this well, that's the, the colors that are going to be shown. These are the, that's the time from injector in days. So we can see here in the, and kind of getting back to where we're talking about short circuiting versus if we have just baffles to flow. In the tank model, this shows breakthrough time versus sweep efficiency. And so we can see relatively short breakthrough time. The sweep efficiency here as compared to the one here is about the same. It's just that these baffles cause it to would move more slowly, so the breakthrough time is less than in this case. But where we have these laterally discontinuous mudstone drapes, we have this short circuiting, and the flow is primarily along the base of that point bar. Breakthrough time is much higher, and the sweep efficiency is much lower. But could you go back for a second? Yeah. Just uh, one more, and then one more. You know, in the lower one, when you've added the grain size model, yeah. He's already alluding that within within your lithological units, there is a, a broad distribution of property. Yes. And so, if you will introduce that into your numerical model, yes, you will have. And we did. Okay. Yeah, I just given the time, I don't have to. Okay. So we actually did two D and three D models, and but I'm for just to get the point across is there's this internal heterogeneity, and like okay. you discussed it that we have to try to capture in our 3D subsurface models, but we don't always necessarily do that, yeah. e even in the, in the oil industry. We do to certain degrees, but in some cases we don't. But no, that's a very good point. So we end up with this. And so after that, what, what was determined was with the, with the tripod-based LIDAR, and since that was done, of course, the technology has advanced quite a bit. 
But at the time, we tried to use that on some of the canyon walls, and you saw the, the canyon walls in Toll Canyon there. At the time, we, we just weren't getting the returns with the equipment to be able to image the outcrop with the, with the laser scanner. And so what we did was, instead of using the tripod-based data, we, we contracted and did an aerial LIDAR survey with American companies. So that was done in June, April through June of 2005. And so for comparison, this shows Cole Canyon. Uh, town of Palisade is right here, known for its peaches and vineyards. And so the, the field-based mapping that we did with handheld GPS unit and measured sections is this blue area. And then the area that we mapped in more detail is with the LIDAR, aerial LIDAR, is shown by this kind of like yellowish area. If you look at all the sandstone body measurements uh, and the paleo current data from primarily from the field mapping where we actually made those measurements, the mean sediment transport direction is basically in this orientation. This is north, so it's about 75 degrees as far as azimuth. And so what you can see here, both with the field mapping and with the LIDAR mapping, is the way the canyon walls have been kind of carved out, we kind of have a picture, for the most part, of an orientation of those sandstone bodies uh, parallel to paleo flow here, and primarily perpendicular to paleo flow there. And you can see that in the statistics, as far as the dimensional statistics of the deposits when uh, you make those measurements. Okay, so for comparison here, here's just a photo mosaic of Cole Canyon, and here's the LIDAR uh, draped with the ortho photos on top. And so, what we were trying to get, just the basic dimensional statistics for thicknesses and apparent width from those data, a student by the name of Henriquez Pangetan at Colorado School of Mines actually did most of this work. There was a professor, Neil Hurley, who was at Colorado School of Mines at the time, who was also involved in the project, and Henriquez was one of his students. And so he used uh, a, a, a program where he brought in those data and almost mapped it kind of like seismic data in this geospatial program. And so if we compare, these are map views. This is a map view. Uh, again, this is uh, one square mile. And this, these are the, the traces of the pluvial deposits based just on the GPS. So that's this area down in here. And then this shows, we've expanded that with the LIDAR measurements. So gone from what, 136 sandstone bodies up to about 668 sandstone bodies. And of those, there are about 120 of them are the actual same sandstone body. And so and we're breaking this out by sandstone body type. So crevasse blades versus our point bars versus stacked point bars, the multi-story channel deposits. And so then this shows the statistical information on those deposits. So this is apparent width. And, and really, again, as I told you about how the canyon walls you know, what nature is providing us to look at, we don't exactly know where we're cutting it, so really we should put apparent thickness here as well. So apparent thickness versus apparent width. And you can see how the different deposits kind of, uh, their distributions kind of show here on this, uh, on this plot. In general, the, the, the crevasse plate deposits are much thinner than, say, the single story or the multi-story sandstone bodies. Uh, what I didn't show you, those much larger amalgamated uh, channel complexes there's not as many of those, so 17 measurements we've made, but those tend to be much larger in scale. Those are the ones that are laterally, uh, laterally extensive across many areas, much of the basin. So you can map those on a much regional scale. So that shows information regarding the, the different types of fluvial deposits and their dimensions, but ultimately we have to take that into the subsurface. Again, whether it's a whether it's a geothermal reservoir or whether it's a petroleum reservoir, we have to make an interpretation of these different deposits, say from well logs or from seismic, so that we can begin to map them. And I just, um, this is just to point out there's different ways of doing this, and some more simple than others. I mean, you can do more of a manual type of interpretation that you, whereby you can pair those well log responses to core, where in the core you can make some type of interpretation of the different types of fluvial deposits and then use our well logs to try to break those out such that we can come up with some type of uh, characteristics from the well logs that in non-cored wells we can use those criteria to interpret the different types of sandstone bodies. 
or you can do more sophisticated things, more quantitative approaches. There's different ways to do that, whereby again you're constraining this to core, but you're, you have core information, you have well log data, and then you're trying to use some type of uh, algorithm or some type of a quantitative approach to estimate those different sandstone bodies, in this case, in non-cored wells. And so we really need to do that because we need to try to map these spatially in the subsurface. And so the, the next part of this is, what are we doing with this data? So one of the, in, interest, one of the things that's of interest to the industry here was what is the spatial distribution of these deposits and how are they interconnected? such that, depending on that connectivity, how many wells might we need to put into a given field in order to deplete it? But it's the same type of question that we might ask for a geothermal reservoir as well. What's the connectivity? How far apart do we need to put the injector and producer in order to produce that resource? And so to do that, and really what I think is the only way to begin to try to address this is you have to think of it in terms of three dimensions. So we build three-dimensional models to assess reservoir connectivity and the potential flow paths of those deposits. This is an outcrate crop based model. And there's different methods that we can use that I'm not going to go into today, different geostatistical methods to model the distribution of those deposits. In this case, this is these are heavily constrained through the outcrop data. And then we can look at those different sandstone bodies by type and say something about how they're interconnected. And for a given well spacing, for example, or depending on how far apart we put our wells, how much of that reservoir are we actually depleting? Or perhaps if it's a geothermal reservoir, what sandstone bodies are actually interconnected to the wells when we're injecting and producing? And so we run a whole bunch of different models looking at different scenarios for those different fluvial deposits. And from this, we can begin to look at, depending on the number of wells that we put within our reservoir, say from just one well to say up to 16 wells or even more. This is a 10 acre spacing, the wells are 660 feet apart. And then also depending on how much sand is in our interval of interest, we're gonna get different amounts of connect, static connectivity in our reservoir. So this graph just summarizes all, all those models. This shows our net gross ratio here, our sandstone percent. And this shows connectivity of sandstone within the reservoir. And the connectivity measurement here is if we look at what percentage or what volume of sandstone is connected to the wells as compared to the total sandstone in the model. And we look at this by well spacing. So all the way up to an academic 2.5 acre well spacing. Obviously, if we're putting that many wells, we basically show that everything's connected up. But a plot like this, what it's useful for showing is, for example, if we go from, say, a 20 acre well spacing to a 10 acre well spacing, what's the improvement in overall connectivity by doing that? This is actually one of the original motivations by the company, companies for this type of information because they were wanting, in order to increase the well density in these fields, they had to go to the, in this case, it's Colorado, so they had to go to the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to justify, say, a higher density of wells. And so by using this type of information, like with outcrop, they can then justify saying, look, we're not connecting, we're not draining the reservoir completely at a given well spacing, say at a 40 acre well spacing, and we really need to go down to a 10 acre well spacing in order to do that. And the other thing that you could do, for example, is look at what's the impact of different fluvial deposits on connectivity. So what this shows, for example, is if we only consider point bars, we might show a range of different connectivities down here that are lower, whereas if we have crevasse plains that actually exhibit reservoir quality that's high enough, those actually might be contributing to flow, so the overall connectivity may increase if we consider the crevasse blades as reservoir quality rock. Uh, in a lot of cases out here in the Piance, they, they may not be. Okay, so some ob observations. So, evaluation of reservoir and basin heterogeneity, connectivity, and flow paths relies on sound geological characterization, as everybody has said previously, at different scales. Uh, the amount, or the net to gross ratio, the sandstone percent, the arrangement, the stratigraphic architecture, and the characteristics, so for example, internal heterogeneity, crossing permeable deep distribution, of these deposits controls the storage and the flow paths. And then static and dynamic connectivity analysis based on these highly constrained outcrop models and, or even subsurface data are useful to assess potential flow paths. 
And then from my standpoint, in terms of the issues, I think the same issues that would be of concern for the subsurface gas res reservoirs would be the same type of issues for the, the geothermal. And so that, that is depending on the stratigraphic, uh, these types of stratigraphic geothermal reservoirs of interest, what are the geometries and dimensions of the sedimentary deposits and how do they vary spatially? How do we identify or estimate the deposits and properties from subsurface well data? So we're gonna to have to do that to map them. And then what are the most appropriate methods to actually do the mapping? And I really didn't touch on that, that would be a whole other talk, but what methods do you actually use to begin to map the spatial distribution of those deposits? And that's not trivial either. And trying to capture that stratigraphic and sedimentological heterogeneity in our models. And so, end with this again, this area that we've worked, it's an area where there's a bunch of wild mustangs that's on one of these, one of four wild horse and burrow preserves in northeastern Colorado. So, questions? So in, in sweep efficiency, so in that particular case, since those were 2D models, that would be what is the area that's coming in, that, that water is coming in contact with going across that model. If it's three dimensions, it would be what volume would be injected water coming in contact with uh, across that model. So for what, what actual, the water that's actually coming across Water that's actually coming across is being injected. You can see that lower case, the sweep efficiency was much lower because there was a whole upper part that that water wasn't even coming in contact with. So in that case, what fraction, what percentage of that area is coming in contact with the water? Or if it's 3D, it's what volume? Uh, Matt, Jim Gates with the U.S. Carolina Management. I'm a petroleum engineer, and my accolades to you in that. 12 years worth of research, uh, spending a large part of my career associated with lenticular sands. This was great. This is, this is great to see. And it shows uh, where the industry is going with downspacing, you know, in much, much larger projects. And again, it's illustrated. What's cool, and my question is uh, again, with the work that you folks have done in the Chasen segments, and a lot, of, a lot of this discussion here is base, basin centric uh, geothermal grade basin. And we're talking about sediments that are much, much older, like Cambrian, Pennsylvania, et cetera. Could you, and as you illustrated on your issues at the tail end, maybe take an estimate of using this same approach? Because I know with Rick and others, that's a question about black rock getting up on the outcrops. Right. But these things are much, much older, much more consolidated. Could you speak to that? Yeah. So, Jim, I think it was, you were talking earlier about the structure. You were talking about, for example, instead of maybe looking at this on a basin scale, you might look at this in terms of the scale of a field or reservoir. You can almost do the same thing here. So some of these might be very laterally extensive across the basin, and some groundwater aquifers are like that, very regional types of aquifers. But we can also approach this in terms of, like Jim was talking about, tackling these as individual fields and doing the detailed work there. Someone also had mentioned with a lot of the geothermal resources that we may not have all the well data, for example, we might have maybe some seismic data, but not that many wells. So maybe that's where the outcrop information might be necessary to combine with the seismic to augment our understanding of the subsurface. The, the, the types of mapping and modeling that's done here could be on, done on a regional, more of a regional scale as well, as it is on, as I've been doing more on a reservoir scale. So I think many of the techniques that I'm talking about are directly applicable to the sub deeper subsurface sedimentary rocks. And then as Rick was talking about, even some of those in the peons even, some of those deeper formations, and I think it was carbonates that you're talking about, have high, really high frosty and permeability, potentially can serve as an aquifer. If that's the case, that would be positive, but in other cases, because they are deeper, it could be that they've been impacted so much, or maybe there's been so much alteration that their porosity is included and the permeability so that they may not be candidate. At least your mapping would help delineate that. But yeah, yeah. so from the from the uh, either outcrop or what subsurface data there are, the same types of technologies and methods could be implemented. Yeah. 
wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. I have an old question, but I think it needs to be revisited, especially when we are thinking in terms of these studies of beta geology in order to propagate properties to the rest of us. And, and the old question is, how can we quantify in a very systematic manner the relevance of the study outcrops in relation to the reservoir. And you know, I'm not a geologist, but I presume there are multiple types. Some outcrops are just the flanks of the reservoir, others are, are being uplifted. And, yeah. and so maybe we need to classify what they are. You know, I did one work on the Woodford where I had logs all the way from the outcrop to the reservoir. And from the work that I do, the classes were different. So clearly, I couldn't move properties from the outcrop to the reservoir. Right. But there's a lot of information, as you've shown, that can be moved. So yeah. what can we say yeah. about the outcrops to help us doing that? So he raises a good point. One of the key things that you have to do when you're starting this type of study is answer the question, is this a good analog for the subsurface field that I'm trying to use it for? There are certain types of data that you can glean from these outcrops or other outcrops, and there's other data that you probably wouldn't want to use. So for example, in this case, this area has been uplifted. If you, we've taken samples from outcrop. If you look at the porosity and permeability from the outcrop, you know, really high porosity, really high permeability. Whereas in the subsurface of the Peons Basin, and I didn't necessarily focus on that in this talk, but those are tight gas sandstones. They've been cemented quite a bit. There's storage, but you know, it's very low permeability. So there's no way you could use the porosity and perm data from outcrop as an analog for the subsurface. But the geometries, and the lithologic variability is definitely applicable. The other thing you might not want to use from outcrop in this particular area, but you might be able to use it in other areas, are fractures or fracture distribution, where you just have to be careful about when you're mapping fractures from outcrop, because this area has been uh, experienced different tectonic regimes since the deposits have been buried. The, the deposits in the subsurface have been buried and have been under different tectonic stresses such that the fractures, for example, that are distributed in the subsurface may be very different in character to what's present in the outcrop. That, that might vary from place to place and from basin to basin. Here there's concern about using the outcrop-based fracture information as a guide for the subsurface. But that would be an example of something you have to be careful with just because of the, the structural history of an area. Diagenesis. And then diagenesis too, yeah. So the porosity and permeability of the outcrop is so it's so porous because it's been exposed to meteoric diagenesis, there's been a lot of dissolution. And so the only thing you wear you might be able to use those data in some way with potentially might be relative changes between different rock types that you wouldn't want to use the magnitude. You're the I think so. Yeah. Uh, so the permeability that you were talking about is all matrix permeability, is that correct? And I didn't really even focus on permeability here. Uh, but, well, but you've got flow. Uh, so right. Presumably that involves permeability. Yeah, I didn't focus on it though. Right, no, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we've mapped, uh, uh, and we have one case, but it's, it's somewhat similar to this. We, were, we can directly map fractures in the subsurface. And, uh, there using was, what type of data? Uh, we're using uh, scientific division tomography to do this. Okay. And so this is, I, I'll, I have the thing on this for you. Okay. Uh, but the, the thing we observed was that the, um, it was in a field uh, uh, in the Gulf Coast and so forth. Uh, but the thing we observed was that the, uh, all the permeability was, was fracture permeability. But it was also located, uh, these were channels that were cutting through the bars, channels which were thinner actually than the bars, was where all the fracture permeability was. And uh, so, uh, but again, uh, that's where also <laughs> the production was, and it was being controlled by the fractures, which did relate to the, in this case, the thickness, uh, well, in this case, the I assume we're talking yeah. pretty much the same. But uh, so I, I'm, I'm a bit of a loss as to you know, how you derive flow from simply you know, the, the permeability and matrix. So if you were dealing with a reservoir where fractures were, obviously if you were dealing with a reservoir 
where fractures were critical, you'd have to incorporate that, that as well. So you'd have to deal with both the matrix and the fracture permeability. Yeah. As you just mentioned, the outcrop models are really capturing the, sort of the architecture and the geometry and sort of noting the scale of compartmentalization. Have you been able to take any field uh, reservoir production data to look at, you know, based on the well spacing, what sorts of, of, of compartmentalization scales you're observing in the field and relate that to your, your observations from the outcome? Yeah, that's a really good question. One, one of the issues is whereby we haven't been able to do that is because the way they complete the, the wells in, the, in, in this part, at least, at least in this basin, is they complete the whole interval. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of all commingled together. And so there's no way to really relate a specific interval to a certain stratigraphic architecture that we're trying to uh, map. But if you could, if, if you had the production information by zone, then you could begin to do history matching and fluid flow simulation to try to match that production information by zone to help improve or to say, are these models even potentially realistic or not? In this particular case, you can't really do that. But that's, a, that's an excellent point. Okay. Thank you, I speak.